morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here. <laughs> you don't know how happy I am. Um, it's really like coming back home, and thank you so much. Uh, but to start with, I really have to thank um, Hojo-san, of course, uh, checking in with us uh, in New York City from time to time uh, to make sure we are safe and sound. And also um, Hoko-san, and then um, <laughs> the whole team of uh, local priests, uh, Hoshin, Doju, Seigen, uh, keeping this place so well uh, during this really challenging time of two years. Uh, we went through a really hard time as well in New York City. Um, some of our members died, and uh, some of us actually uh, lost our family members and friends. Uh, but somehow we are uh, slowly coming out of it. So uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, in uh, 2019, uh, Hojo-san actually uh, kindly uh, introduced me to this wonderful temple in Japan uh, called Myokoji. So uh, I went there and my plan was uh, staying there until last minute, like the beginning of April 2020 and then directly fly into Myokoji <laughs> and then uh, practice with you uh, on that year. But what happened was uh, this uh, temple, Myo Myokoji, is uh, situated in the town called Hakata, uh, which is the northern portion of the southern island of Kyushu. So uh, this is uh, a traditionally main port and also, of course, we have airport as well. Uh, so therefore, the largest numbers of the Asian tourists and immigrants also arrive there. So as a matter of fact, as early as in December to January uh, 2020, we became one of the first site to record COVID cases. So by March, uh, people are really tell starting to tell me, if, Eastern, if you really need to go back to the United States, you have to go right now. <laughs> So I cut it short and I came back uh, March 10th, year 2020. Then immediately after, like five days later, New York City completely went into uh, lockdown. So um, it's been a kind of strange two years, uh, but we learned so much out of this pandemic as well. Um, I do not know what will happen next, for the next three uh, months. Uh, listening to all these news from Europe and Asia, we may actually uh, receive another wave. But uh, Hojo-san also told me, uh, as much as we could do, we tried to do uh, as close as possible, as traditional uh, geango, uh, summer intensive practice period uh, should go. So, a um, couple of wonderful opportunities I received for uh, uh, functioning as a uh, practice leader for this Geango practice period is uh, one of them is starting today is 10 time talk series and also a workshop. So uh, I kind of thought about what should I do. Um, it was very different um, two years ago, uh, but after two years of this pandemic, I kind of thought through, thought through, thought through. And then I decided to come up with some theme. So uh, this theme is, um, this is the theme for 10 time talks and also uh, my workshop is uh, two sides of reality in one action. Uh, this is actually a complete cutout <laughs> from Okuma Roshi's book, the wonderful book uh, called uh, Realizing Genjo Koan. Um, you probably do remember this line. Dogen said, that to see one reality from two sides, which is relative and absolute, is not enough. So understanding is just not enough. That's what he's talking about. He said, we should also express these two sides in one action. Uh, this is uh, the famous shusho ichinyo, uh, practice and verif verif uh, verification is one. But it's a very uh, wonderful way to capitalize the line. So I thought this is a great um, kind of theme, so to speak, to uh, go through all those 10 time talks and also uh, 
workshop as well. Now, uh, I have kind of layered uh, explanation about this. So, uh, as today is the introduction of this uh, 10 time series and also workshop, I just kind of like to explain this in detail. So, um, uh, I'll talk about this more in detail, but my biggest connection and attraction with Okumara Roshi is, of course, Genzoe. And uh, I believe Genzoe is a pinnacle of uh, not only for San Shinji's uh, summer angle, but in the Zen community globally. Uh, so uh, I really uh, like, uh, you know, uh, keep joining Okumara Roshi's Genzoe. As a matter of fact, for years, I planned my whole life around his schedule. <laughs> so what happens is at the beginning of the year, I open the calendar and I say, OK, he does Genzoe in May and November in San Shinji, and he's invited to San Francisco in August. So I just block out those time. And then I call uh, all of my friends and say, hey, let's, can we make a team and go to San Shinji together, et cetera, et cetera. But I have to say, uh, Genzo is kind of difficult, isn't it? And so <laughs> studying Shobo Genzo is really difficult. Um, you know, sometimes some people uh, calls me or sends me email say, saying, I'd like to go to Genzo. Uh, and then I say, of course, you should come. But uh, the reason is um, sometimes uh, I invite somebody who's really highly educated, PhD, MA, et cetera, et cetera, doctors, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, they don't really have some sort of foundation to uh, understand what Okumaro is talking about. So uh, they come in, and then for the first one day, second day, they're kind of in, uh, in, uh, you know, in, uh, in tuned with his uh, talk, and then start to feel, okay, this makes no sense. <laughs> and then they get bored and I get blamed later on. So, um, um, but it's really not just us. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things I really like to uh, do uh, this season is that I want to uh, offer you uh, lots of fun episodes, uh, not only about uh, Okumara Roshi, but Okumara Roshi's teacher, Uchiyama Roshi, and also his teacher, Sawaki Roshi, our own lineage. Uh, but one of the things uh, that really struck me was uh, Uchiyama Roshi says this from time to time in his uh, lectures on Shobo Genzo. Uh, he graduated from Waseda University. Uh, this is one of the top five universities in Japan. And then uh, around that time, he was very interested in Dogen. And then uh, he really wanted to get hold of uh, uh, Shobo Genzo. And so he gets uh, get hold of Shobo Genzo and he tries to read it, but uh, he just simply don't understand what it's talking about. And he doesn't understand so much so, he doesn't understand what he doesn't understand. <laughs> As a matter of fact, that was my first impression when I opened uh, uh, Shobo Genzo for the first time when I was in my 30s. So I always have to laugh at that. Um, so, um, Uchiyama Roshi eventually gets hold of the commentary, which really opens his door to understand Shobo Genzo. But uh, in my case, what I did was, um, as a matter of fact, I feel Dogen's Shobo Genzo is like a really high peak mountain, and he, Shobo Genzo is on the top of the peak. But to appreciate the peak, I really have to start from the ground. And this uh, mountain is a huge mountain, has a huge slope. But the first step is really starting to understand the slope to climb up to the peak. And then uh, for me, there were uh, some selected uh, texts uh, that actually created a foundation to uh, climb up to the peak. And one of the texts was actually given by Okumara Roshi to me 22 years ago. So uh, I thought maybe it's a good idea to entice everybody uh, to come to, uh, you know, Okumara Roshi's teaching on Shobo Genzo. Uh, just like what I did, uh, maybe we can study something really creates 
uh, the foundation for us to understand what Dogen is talking about, but a little more easier with a sense of fun, because I really think it's really uh, important that we have joy and enjoyment uh, to study Dharma. Uh, otherwise, it just gets so heady and it's really not fun and it doesn't last. So for me, it is very important to be um, this uh, study process really fun and enjoyable. So I really like to bring all of those joy and enjoyment into this process of introducing these uh, texts. Uh, I uh, intentionally uh, selected five texts. Uh, one of them is Kannongyo, and the next one is the collection of koan called Shoyo Roku. Uh, most of the time uh, in America, it is translated as a book of serenity, I believe, yeah. And then uh, Okumaru Roshi also, uh, together with the Taigen san in Chicago, uh, did an incredible translation of Eihei Shinji, uh, pure standard of uh, Eihei Dogen for uh, Zen community. And um, uh, Gakudo Yojinshu. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't really remember the English title correctly, but it's uh, pointers, points to remember, uh, to be careful with for someone who studied the, uh, the way. I think that's the translation. And then lastly, Ejo's uh, only writing. Uh, so I hope you will be uh, able to find the same type of joy and ease and fun, just like I did. And out of that, maybe we can create some sort of foundation uh, to uh, enjoy even more and deeply with this uh, wonderful teaching of Shobo Genzo by Okumura Roshi. So that's one thing. Uh, and then, of course, next step is kind of layered with that. Um, you know, um, I'm really nobody, and then I really don't have any presence in, you know, uh, internet world. But even I sometimes receive emails from several people, like, Isan, what should I read? And what translation should I read? I just don't understand this at all. As a matter of fact, uh, it's not just the uniquely American situation. It's the same situation in Japan as well. Our problem may be a little different. Um, in our case, there are too many books on Dogen. Uh, Uchiyama Roshi often says, uh, you know, listening to recordings uh, and also looking at his books, he often says, He's quite a sharp tongue. He says, well, you know, there are so many commentaries on Dogen, inter, uh, contemporary Japanese translation of Dogen, so much so, uh, it's almost like a trash. You have to brew it out and throw it into the trash pail. Uh, I wouldn't say that, but you know, Uchiyamanoshi can say it. <laughs> but um, it is really true, it's very confusing. Uh, Uchiyamaroshi actually said uh, when he didn't understand the Shobo Genzo, he didn't go directly into just any commentary uh, available because he knew, uh, you know, uh, formative years of understanding Dharma is very important. And if you take some sort of wrong information into you, it's very hard to deprogram it later on. I can tell you because that's exactly what I went through for almost 15 years prior to uh, meeting Okumura Roshi. So um, I'm very cautious about uh, picking up the commentary as well. And then eventually I really discovered with support of Okumura Roshi's information, there is a such a thing I would call blue blood line of Dogen teachers. And those are actually our own direct lineage. So there's a, a menzan and the Nishiari Bokuzan, and then underneath there's Okasotan, and then there will be Sawaki and Uchiyama, then come to Okumura Roshi. So um, uh, by you know, uh, introducing those, uh, I would say, texts around Shobo Genzo, again, all these people have many, many commentaries. So I like to also introduce commentaries on, not only Shobo Genzo, but on these texts by Uchiyama Roshi and Sawaki Roshi, and also Aoyama Roshi, et cetera, et cetera. And then this way, I hope, um, well, first of all, 
I'm not sure how uh, you, uh, aware you are, <laughs> how lucky we are <laughs> to find this really like a core portion of the blue blood lineage in here right now. So uh, maybe this will help you to kind of get familiar with, more intimate with your own lineage. And then maybe uh, you see the importance of it as well. And hopefully, maybe someone like Dojo will probably translate these commentaries as well. Uh, on the process of this, I actually transcribed many of those Japanese books into Japanese in hope someday uh, they, you know, it's very difficult to translate from audio, just a speech. So I thought some people may eventually uh, be inspired to translate these commentaries as well. These are wonderful commentaries uh, on Lotus Sutra, Shoyo Roku, etc., etc. So uh, that's my second layer uh, of the theme. Uh, by doing so, I already started to incorporate these episodes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I do understand uh, you've been reading uh, Homeless Kodo. Uh, that's a wonderful practice. It's Wednesdays, yeah? So I really invite you. Uh, I, I think it's available online as well, yes? Yeah. So. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Ah, oh, good, good. So um, it's a part of it, you know. Uh, Okumaro, she translated this uh, wonderful book about uh, uh, homeless Kodo. But I li really like to bring lots of episodes about uh, Sawaki and Uchiyama, et cetera, et cetera. And also, I do know uh, Okumaro, she's really shy about it. But I like to talk about my episodes with Okumaro as well. So this way, you will feel really uh, you know, familiar and intimate with us and with our uh, lineage. Now, um, also, it is really true that, uh, you know, uh, it is commonly said among all of us uh, in Japan as well, that uh, um, our founder, Dogen, uh, was so productive uh, in writing. Uh, and then so we received so much bulky, you know, teachings in written form. So we spend lots of time uh, studying his teaching. So therefore we tend to get really heady. But as you really start to unwrap Shobo Genzo and also related the texts, uh, what he's talking about and what the others are talking about is really about action portion. I don't know really action is a good translation, but when I'm talking about action, it is gyo. So it is a practice portion, actual living of this, uh, out of this understanding of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, teaching. Uh, to me, I always felt uh, Dogen's teaching, Buddha's teaching, Buddhist teaching is a bit like an ontology, uh, which is expanded and eliminated by action itself. And then all of these texts is really talking about action, action, just as Okumaro, she says, Dongen is saying understanding is not enough. Most important <laughs> thing is actually express it in your life. So um, looking back at my life, I'm uh, 67 years old, so I'm already a retired man. But looking at, uh, back at my life, I started to work professionally when I was 18. And then I went through kind of drastic change in my uh, profession. But the longest years of my uh, working years, I spent most of the time uh, in hospitals, hospices, nursing homes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, as a licensed professional caregiver, uh, particularly specialized in. I really don't like this word, but normally called end of life care. So um, I really like to share how I did it. Uh, hoping it will some sort of have some sort of resonance to your own life. You know, after all, our job uh, as a Buddhist practitioner is to try to understand, illuminate, and clarify what is taught to us, and then actually apply it and manifest it into our life. But each one of our life is different. So therefore, I don't know who you are, and I don't know your life. But maybe I can talk about what I did with my own life experience. And maybe that will somehow have some sort of resonance. And particularly uh, the type of the area of the work uh, I spent nearly 25 years 
was basically um, crisis management. Uh, so, um, and also the area of the work I was, I entered it into uh, because of the AIDS epidemic and that really highly politicized, uh, very, very confusing time. So hopefully, uh, you know, right now we are going through a really difficult time. Not only pandemic, there's a war and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, people are agitated, people are confused. So therefore maybe talking about my experience with the previous epidemic and previous political upheaval, et cetera, et cetera, and then trying to live as a Buddhist practitioner, trying to bring <coughs> this teaching into one action, uh, maybe there's some sort of a suggestion. Uh, I really don't know how you would do it because it's each one of your task, and but uh, I can kind of share what I did. So those are the uh, layers of the theme uh, I really like to present uh, this time during the angle. <coughs> Excuse me. A few days ago, I went to see Okumura Roshi when I arrived, <coughs> and then I expressed, um, well, you know, around 65 as a benchmark, I really started to see my rapid pace of uh, aging process. <laughs> Everything starts to dry up and sag. So, uh, you know, sometimes I really have to keep drinking water to uh, uh, prevent the dryness of the throat. So now, um, immediately going into the first topic of uh, Kanongyo, uh, I really like to talk about myself as well. Maybe this is going to uh, be a little bit of an introduction to uh, the Sangha. Uh, as you know, um, I'm a part of the Okumura Roshi's global network of the disciple. Uh, as you know, uh, this is the hub, and then uh, we have, this is a very strong hub, I think, and it's continued to be, do so. But it, we have a strong pipeline, not only Japan and the US, but also Europe as well. So um, I don't live in Bloomington. And uh, uh, every time I come by, I try to stay as long as possible because I really like to be here. This really feels like a second home of mine. Uh, but sometimes uh, I have to be here just for special events. And the special events are usually conducted in silence. We really don't know, you know each other <laughs> very much. I only know a few people. So uh, some of you uh, who are particularly new to uh, San Shinji, uh, uh, who joined the San Shinji community during these two years of a very strange virtual practice time, uh, you don't know me at all. And you probably, probably think like, why is he here? Uh, so uh, maybe I could explain that too as a lead into uh, uh, Kanongyo, uh, because my connection with Okumura Roshi actually starts with Kanongyo, which probably Okumura Roshi himself doesn't remember. <laughs> Okumura Roshi uh, meets so many people, uh, and then uh, this is kind of like a good example. Uh, all of us are priests or whoever it is who. Uh, kind of uh, representing Dharma have to be kind of cautious because one little encounter and one little thing or one little thing you give and talk to actually affects others so much. So I was affected just by one simple encounter with Okumara Roshi and how I am right now is really enticed by that encounter which probably Okumara Roshi doesn't remember. So anyway, what happened was, okay, I'm going to make it kind of short to the point. Uh, I was born in Japan in 1955. Uh, so I'm uh, in the completely in the uh, medium age of baby boomer. Uh, to make it very short, uh, I was born and raised in the town called Kamakura. Uh, people probably like Hoko-san and Dojo-san probably know this word, Kamakura very well because um, Kamakura is also uh, known to be Kamakura Buddhism in the uh, you know, uh, Buddhist Academy. Uh, Kamakura was the uh, newly arising uh, capital in uh, Dogen's time. Uh, 
this is around the time uh, Japan went through upside down and upside down. The whole thing just completely went into. I often are uh, trying to explain it. I often uh, compare it into French Revolution. And so um, anyway, this uh, uh, Dogen's time is such kind of chaotic, traumatic time in Japan, which I often uh, have to say that to make people remember. Uh, because if you really, uh, you know, studying Dogen's uh, writing, it's so calm, you know, so serene. But as a matter of fact, I, outside of this sereneness, this whole thing, <laughs> it's not even like COVID-19 time. It's really awful time. But anyway, uh, this is a town that actually uh, arose around that time. And this was the uh, town that has a government by newly arising clan, very violent clan, which eventually will be called samurai. So um, interestingly, around the time I was born and raised, Kamakura became a very much like a cultural town uh, and then historic town. Uh, this is a town of uh, Bloomington has 80,000 people, it's a community, yeah? So it's about like a double, triple maybe population, but it's a very small place. And in this very small place, uh, there are five major Rinzai monasteries. So my first encounter with the Buddhism was of course Rinzai. And then, you know, I went to the uh, kindergarten and also elementary school first years uh, directly underneath of these uh, temples. So my first encounter with the Buddhism was um, in uh, first grade during the summer break, we are invited by Enbakuji. And then we do uh, Zazen uh, practice. Of course, you know, you're eight years old and you're like, so uh, you are really not able to and then uh, you were giggling and et cetera, et cetera. But that was my first introduction. So therefore, again, formatively, uh, you think that's Buddhism, right? So uh, eventually uh, I grow up and then I go to university. And then during the time of university, I got this part-time job, which brought to me uh, after graduation, immediately I became a full-time. And then this was the, uh, um, uh, American-owned uh, trans uh, international um, media company. So I was assigned in uh, their office in Paris, France for a couple of years. And this was 1980 to 82. Uh, I was quite young and I was really proud because I was only 25, got this really fancy job, etc., etc. But anyway, I really missed America. What happened was, um, my parents died very young when I was a teenager. So my sisters told me, uh, you know, you look really depressed. You should really uh, go to California and get the sun. So I spent a long time in California uh, healing from the grief. Uh, <coughs> so my image of outside of Japan is really based on this blue sky and the sun shine in California. Just imagine that. And then after that, 25 years old, you go to France in the middle of the winter. There's no sun and it's so cold and misty. So I really missed um, America. And what I did was I trans, uh, I, I got hold of the trans, uh, uh, what's the English word? Uh, receiving the uh, magazine from California. And then uh, magazine I chose to as advocate uh, probably you guys don't know this anymore. Advocate was one of the first American LGBTQ uh, community magazine. Uh, it's not like those uh, magazine uh, Margaret Cho talks about. <laughs> uh, it is a really politically, you know, charged uh, magazine. So uh, what happens is at the beginning, I really didn't speak a word of French and I didn't have any friends. Uh, particularly for the first three months was very difficult. And then, so in, on uh, Saturday and Sunday, I walked to uh, Louvre Museum. And uh, uh, along the Louvre Museum, there's a theory garden. And then I carry a copy of Advocate magazine and I read it, hoping someday I will get to the United States. <laughs> and then I remember this so clearly. It was a very cold January morning. 
and I opened this, the first uh, recent issue I, I received in the mail, and there was a story about mysterious disease. Currently, they're calling this as a, a gay cancer. And uh, it was such a strange thing. Two years from that, uh, that time, I was uh, transferred to New York headquarters, and my office situated in the middle of a Greenwich village. As you know, it's the middle of the uh, you know, artist community. And then um, I was assigned, uh, I, I was a journalist. Uh, my job was to report uh, from America to the Japanese segment. So I was actually uh, interviewing in English, but writing the reports in Japanese for their Japanese equivalent uh, for the networks and also periodicals. And I was assigned for uh, art, entertainment, lifestyle, and fashion. Can you imagine? <laughs> but what happened was I'm in the middle of Greenwich Village, I'm in the middle of artist community, and I'm actually interviewing and mingling my uh, you know, elbows with all these artists and fashion designers and all of that, which is the community that was the hardest hit, first hit <coughs> by this uh, AIDS epidemic. So what happens is by 1985, uh, do you remember roller decks? Maybe all of you, oh, oh yeah, God, thank you. <laughs> Way before iPhone, <laughs> there was something called roller decks and Filofax, yes? So each year at the end of the year, I go through my roller decks and I start to plug, oh, he died, oh, he died. I have to toss this in, into the dust chute, he died. I remember by 1985, it became 25% of my roller decks. So of course, you know, uh, in this segment, everybody's beautiful, everybody's young, it's such a young industry. So in front of your eyes, all these young, beautiful people, men and women, <coughs> start to shrivel up and die. And then almost each month, and then eventually each every two weeks, eventually every week you have to go to the funeral. It was such incredible impact. You know, come to think about that, <laughs> this is really like um, exposing yourself in a true reality of impermanence. So, so I really had to do something about it. So um, two things I did. The first thing was, you know, I don't have any other uh, resource, uh, spiritual resources to count on but Buddhism. So I really looked around the Buddhist community. And at that time in New York City, there was only one uh, Buddhist center, Zen center, which was the Rinzai school. So it was okay. So I went to the Rinzai school and I started to do uh, join Zazen intuitively, and then uh, started to uh, look for any kind of volunteer uh, system. At that time, there wasn't much volunteer system, but in 1985, I found um, some uh, program that I could uh, offer some sort of support in what they called AIDS ward. Uh, we currently don't have that anymore, but in 1980s and 90s, before millennium, most of the, all of those, uh, not most of those, all of those major uh, healthcare organizations in New York, Manhattan, uh, had to dedicate first one side of the corner of the floor, eventually whole floor, eventually whole building into uh, AIDS ward. In 1985, first case I was assigned to was a Japanese man uh, who was living in New York City, and then he got sick. And then so I report to the nursing desk uh, station, and then doctor comes to me, and everybody was so mad and angry and cranky at that time. This is 1985. Not enough information at all. And there are lots of rumors and demo, uh, uh, you know, demagogue going on. And politically, it's so, you know, hyped up. So the, uh, the doctor, I'm sure he was a really compassionate person because he was assigned for the AIDS ward, but he was really rude to me. <laughs> and he said, you know, there's this Japanese man uh, and he's really sick and he has AIDS and he's going to die. And then, uh, so therefore, uh, your uh, job I have to ask you to do 
there's this tiny little woman in the room. This is isolation uh, room. Of course, at that time, everything was isolation room. And then uh, you go there and um, uh, we presume, though they don't speak English at all, but I, we presume he's, she's probably his mother. So go to tell them that you're going to die. It's a matter of, uh, you, do you want to die here or do you want to die in your home? And I suggest you buy tickets right away and bring the son into Japan and have him die there. So that was my first job. <laughs> and then you go to the room, <coughs> and in front of the room, <coughs> There's a three uh, trays of the meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This was after my work hours. So it was uh, kind of like early evening. Uh, three uh, layers of the tray, untouched, breakfast and lunch and dinner, stuck right on top of the floor. You know, currently we don't do these things. But at that time, it was, you know, out of the fear. People didn't get inside of the room. So therefore, if there's nobody coming, of course, you can't come out of the bed anyway. If no one come out of the, uh, the room, they will just place it on the top of the floor. So uh, then there was a door, uh, a sign at the door. To enter the door, you have to wear this, and you have to wear this, you have to wear this, you have to wear this whole garment of the protection. But at that time, the protection was for us so that we don't catch it. And I looked at it, uh, you know, I wasn't particularly medically minded or scientifically minded at that time yet, but I really felt bullshit. <laughs> I'm sorry, is that okay? <laughs> and then I just opened the door and that was my first entry into this work. <clears throat> uh, years goes on because I really had no reason to leave my job. I was doing very well. Um, financially as well, and I really loved my job, but this really starts to pull me in towards this direction. Uh, so I'm really into this uh, world of samsara, so to speak, world of competition, comparison, and everything has to be presented as eternal health, eternal beauty, eternal sexiness, etc., etc. Then on the other side, I really start to see this whole in incredible web of <laughs> interconnectedness and also manifestation of some of those, uh, you know, tragic manifestation of the interconnectedness and impermanence. So I really start to feel like pulled in, pulled in, and pulled in. Uh, you know, there was no sense of a benchmark or no sense of decision making. But by the time uh, millennium comes, kind of strange, almost mysteriously, I found myself being in that realm of work professionally, 100%. It was a very strange feeling. But I guess um, that's how, um, like a magnet, this uh, Buddha Dharma pulls you in. So um, around the millennium, uh, before that, I have heard there was somebody whose name is Issan Dorsey in San Francisco, very kind man. Uh, he was somebody who st uh, comes from Zan San Francisco Zen Center lineage, but eventually uh, he was assigned in this, uh, so to speak, Zen Center, hard to forge the street Zen Center. Uh, in other words, he was offered a site. Uh, it was in Castro District, and he was going to make this building into um, Zen Center. But then what happened was it's in the middle of the uh, height of AIDS epidemic, and uh, this is a Castro district. Just mind you, this is San Francisco anyway. So a uh, whole population was really hit by AIDS. And he sees the people on the street around his, uh, you know, uh, building, <coughs> being sick, homeless, and dying. So therefore, there's no um, other option, so to speak. You immediately try to uh, bring this man into the house, and the next person comes, next person comes, and then eventually it became America's first AIDS-specific uh, hospice residence. And in the middle of that, I think it was in the 90s, I was really starting to feel this pressure of, um, or by that time I was uh, already uh, offering uh, Zazen instruction to the people who come as, uh, in a gay men's health crisis, which was, um, New York City's, not only New York City's, but America's first 
uh, social service organization for the people who are affected by HIV and AIDS. And uh, uh, mind you again, uh, placing you into the uh, you know, timeline, at that time, uh, receiving the diagnosis uh, test result was actually your death sentence. So therefore, uh, people are really desperate to try to find some sort of a solace or some sort of a comfort or peace of mind or some sort of you know, hope to cure or last long. So therefore, there was some kind of upsurge of interest in Zazen meditation or Buddhist meditation. But it was really difficult, you know. Um, sometimes some people come, uh, uh, there was only one medication that's supposed to be utilized uh, effectively. It was called AZT, if you remember that, AZT. Uh, but uh, side effect is really harsh. It makes you nauseated all day long. So sometimes some people come and say, I really like to learn how to meditate, but you know, uh, I may vomit in front of you. Is that okay? So I said, of course it's okay. <laughs> so this person comes in with a, a plastic bucket. And then he, I, I start to say, okay, so first of all, uh, if you can sit on the ground and this is how you sit, and then you say, wait, wait, wait. wait excuse me, and then you go <laughs> come up to me, please go on. <laughs> okay, so I do, so your hand says <laughs> So, um, <laughs> you know, it's actually uh, very stressful. And then um, I think I really start to feel the running out of the spiritual resource so therefore, I was really looking for it. So one day I went to visit San Francisco. Uh, you know, I heard about Isan Dose, and then I felt, you know what? Why don't I just go? This is before internet, and I couldn't find the telephone number either. So I just uh, took the flight and went to San Francisco. This is one of my habits. People always uh, tell me, you know, Isan, you have a bungee jump personality, but. Um, <laughs> Sometimes something really pushes me to the point, I just have to do this. So I took a flight and I went to San Francisco without knowing where it is. With my stupid mind, I really felt he must be very famous in the community. So if I go to Castle District, anyone would probably point out that's the way. But it wasn't the case. So I go in and keep asking the people and walk around and around and around for hours and hours. And then I almost uh, decided, you know what, this wasn't meant to be. And then um, I thought, well, wait a minute, let me cross the street and go to the other side. And then I crossed the street and then two blocks away, magically, there was a heart for the street. And I knock the door, knock the door, knock the door, no one answers. I feel, okay, this is my karma. And then I knock the door, knock the door, knock the door. <laughs> and then suddenly someone who was wearing something like this <laughs> opened the door. And then I kind of started to break down and I explained <coughs> why I came uh, <coughs> because I really wanted to see uh, Isan Dose. And then this man said, oh, I am so sorry. Isan just died. And then my name is Philip Whalen. And then uh, I took over this place after his son died. So if it's okay with you, uh, you can come in and we can talk. And as a matter of fact, after we talked, he said, you know, as a matter of fact, one of the residents just checked out this morning and that was the word he used. <laughs> someone dies and then someone leaves, checked out this room. So you can stay there and learn how to take care of these people. So I did. And then uh, there was also an, my entry into uh, introduction to Zen Hospice Project, which was the uh, hospice project arose from San Francisco Zen Center. So for that, uh, I kept on going back to San Francisco. My best luck, this is a wondrous, strange Buddha connection, Buddha Dharma connection. Uh, I think all of you have this very strange, mystical, you know, almost strange story about how you go into this connection. Uh, in year around millennium, uh, this is something I heard later. 
Okuna Roshi moved his office from Los Angeles to San Francisco to commemorate 800th year of anniversary of Dogen, uh, uh, the birth. So therefore, uh, this uh, international conference was supposed to be held in uh, Stanford University. So it was much easier for him to have office in San Francisco. And then uh, I was going to the uh, program to study directly under Frank Ostaseski. His name I'm going to uh, refer very often because uh, Frank and Okumara Roshi is my two most important mentors. So uh, Frank was the founder of the Hospice Project and started to offer some sort of teaching programs. So I kept on going back. And at that time, I knew uh, Blanche Hartman, a wonderful Blanche, uh, very well. So Blanche told me, Eastern, you can actually stay in us, with us and then uh, go to uh, the office of Zen Hospice Project every day during the summertime. As long as you follow, you know, morning as an evening as an, you're completely free to do so. So I lived in San Francisco Zen Center, and then during uh, after morning Zazen, I just changed my clothes and go across the street. There was a guest house of Zen Hospice Project, and I studied directly under Franco Sosesky, uh, hands on. It was a wonderful time. And one day, someone told me uh, this is a friend whose name is Myoju. She is a Japanese woman uh, who. Uh, studied and uh, received transmission in Daijoji in Ishikawa Prefecture. And this Daijoji is a very important temple for us. As a matter of fact, that's where Okuma Roshi and uh, Katagiri Roshi, I think, many, many years ago, at the international uh, angle. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, she was back in New York, uh, San Francisco, and then she said, there's this man you have to, you have to meet. Uh, who is that? Uh, his name is Shohaku Okumura, Okumura Shohaku. You know, do you, you know the uh, book called uh, Opening the Hand of the Thought, right? So, yes, it's Yamaroshi, right? And at that time, the book was out of print. So therefore, uh, we had to go to Soto School's uh, office, which actually had like the last five copies of the older version of uh, Opening the Hand of the Thought. So uh, two of us went and like, how many do you have? Five. Okay, can we get all of them? <laughs> we, we got the first. So I knew who he was, and then so I, I said, yeah, I'm very interested, let's go. And that's around the time Okura Roshi was offering, I think it was every Sunday, uh, talk about the Shobo Genzo, lecture about Shobo Genzo, in a kind of strange, uh, as you know, San Francisco is really hilly. So Sokoji has two entrance from this ground level and this ground level, but the inside it's like a basement. And this is a large, like, completely nothing room and you have to bring you know those movable chairs and this and etc etc in there there was a shohaku kumura and then there are three of us sitting and there are another three homeless people sleeping and in front of this uh very small crowd okumaroshi as usual this iconic erase board <laughs> in front of it i don't think it was the erase board maybe it was a blackboard and then iconic way, uh, slightly Osaka accented English, and started to talk about, uh, I don't know if you do know, uh, Okumura Roshi's English has a little bit of a trace of Osaka accent in Japanese. <laughs> and then, you know, he speaks very gently and slowly. So my friend actually started to fall asleep, but to me, it was a revolution. <coughs> Sorry. This is kind of dramatic to give a pause. Uh, before that, you know, <laughs> in 1970s and the 80s, we went through a uh, upsurge of this Dogen revival. So by that time, there are so many books on Dogen, just like Uchiyama Uchi Uchi said. And I was so mesmerized, and I didn't know what to buy. And of course, to buy the whole collection, it's a quite the investment. But I did uh, buy uh, two whole sets of Shobo Genzo uh, with, um, you know, uh, contemporary Japanese translation as well. Uh, I'm really attracted to his writing style. It's beautiful. And here and there, there's something striking happens. But I really quite didn't understand how to read it. But then listening to Okuma Roshi, it just completely swung open the door 
into Dogen's world. So I really felt like, wow, this is amazing. And then uh, one of the stay in San Francisco Zen Center, early in the morning, I usually wake up a little extra earlier than anybody else. Uh, I guess this is my habit. So one day I wake up like a little earlier than everybody wakes up. And then I was passing through the main entrance. Then I saw this tall, handsome Japanese man trying to sneak out from the main entrance of the San Francisco Zen Center. So I thought, wait a minute, that's Okumura Shohaku. <laughs> and then later on, I have heard that it was his uh, transitional time because San Shinji was not still ready and he has already left uh, other place. So therefore, Blanche uh, invited him to live in San Francisco Zen Center. And then I grabbed him some other time and I said, why do you leave so early? Where do you go? And he mentioned um, uh, he was a sitting morning zazen in Sokoji. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this uh, structure. Uh, San Francisco's Sokoji, which is uh, you know original Japanese temple uh, where Suzuki Roshi uh, was assigned, is on top of the hill, which is uh, Japan town. And underneath, there's a slope going on. There's a little bit like a valley situation. And this is not a very good uh, neighborhood. At least at that time, it wasn't. And it's very dark, and there's not much you know, city light. And then uh, slightly coming upward, and there's the San Francisco Zen Center. So Okumura Roshi mentioned, you know, as I'm tall, <laughs> he didn't say I'm tall, as he's Japanese, and he's wearing brown robe, some people do make a, 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 don't understand and then come to uh, see him and say, can I become your student? And then if that happens in front of these American teachers, I feel this is kind of uh, disgraceful uh, of him to show such a thing in front of the uh, other people because he really respects what uh, American teachers have done uh, at that time to establish uh, so much and spread the Dharma so much. So he'd rather not to be with them. And he wakes up a little earlier and walk through this really dark streets and climb up the hill and go to Sokoji alone. Then when I heard that, I felt, okay, he's my man. <laughs> then um, uh, one day I had an opportunity uh, actually went to uh, Sokoji and I really wanted to uh, see how uh, it is to sit with him. But, uh, you know, this is over 22 years ago, I think. Uh, Okumura Roshi was still, you know, in his, uh, I guess, 50s. And he was still kind of robust and very healthy. And when I saw him sitting, I really felt, oh God, I'm not good enough to sit with him. <laughs> he looked like a Buddha Seju. And there was some kind of aura. And I, I guess it was probably something created my own projection at all, uh, after all. But I sat farthest away from him. And that was the only one time I really um, made an effort to wake up early and go to Sokoji. But at the other time, um, he had a little bit of time. So he invited me to, let's go out and have dinner. And we went to Japan town and he said, let's go to sushi restaurant. So I thought, what? Japanese priest eat sushi? Uh, there's a word called namangusa bozu in Japanese. <laughs> namangusa bozu meaning a uh, monk who smells like a fishy, fishy smell. <laughs> but as long as he's okay, I, I like sushi, so it's okay. So over the table, uh, we had lots of conversation, but I think uh, remembering that it's not like Okumaru Roshi had a conversation. It was more about, I just vented, vented, and vented, and vented. And he just listened as usual. And then after that, he said, would you like to come to my room and I have something I can suggest you read? And then, um, well, how much time do I have today? You're about an hour in. Right? Oh, wow, I'm sorry. No. I, I'm a very quiet man, actually. Uh, <laughs> but just like Okumura Roshi, when I start to talk about uh, Buddhism, I feel so much joy and I can't stop. So I'm going to stop at this point, okay? Uh, but let me just close this portion. 
And then he has this room, and then, you know, this is a temporary housing for him at that time. So therefore, uh, you know how much, many books he's, he has in, the, uh, in his room, right? But I suppose he was carrying the book. He really felt very important for him at that time. You go into his room, those uh, book, the line of the book was placed. It wasn't as many like that in his room, uh, on, on the floor. And then he pulls out two of them, and he says, you should read this. And that was this. Um, can you? Anyway. <laughs> um, this is actually not the original, uh, because the Sawaki Roshi's collection has been uh, very popular even now. So therefore, it has been already revised twice. And the current one I have is the most current on-command version. Uh, but this was the entire collection of Kodo Sawaki's teaching. And to my biggest surprise, oh, first of all, it was two copies. Uh, one of them was Kannongyo, Avalokiteshvara chapter, chapter 25 of Lotus Sutra. And another one was Gakudo Yojinshu, the pointers to watch for uh, the people who study Buddhism. I held the book, and I hope I didn't show that to Okuma Roshi, and I Hope she doesn't remember this, but I looked at it because it's Kannongyo, it's Lotus Sutra. I thought, are you kidding me? <laughs> the reason is, uh, as someone who went through baby boomer age uh, in Japan, I had a really bad, bad, bad image about, about Lotus Sutra. But um, that I'm going to talk about next week. And then I brought it back home, and then this just exploded. And this was the real beginning of my whole uh, journey. And then eventually, uh, I, uh, of course, uh, after this book, I discovered, uh, of course, with the help of other people, uh, Uchiyama Roshi also wrote the commentary on Kannongyo. This is a legendary commentary. And it is so incredibly powerful. Uh, as usual, as almost everything as uh, these teachers do, on the surface, it's deceivingly easy to read. But when you start to try to kind of contemplate on this, God, this is so hard. Uh, I have heard Howard is trying to translate this, and I think this is a very difficult task. <laughs> um, but uh, this too really became like a real uh, open door for me which I really like to uh, introduce next week. But anyway, um, so, uh, so far today, um, I was uh, talking about introduction uh, into, uh, I, mean, I guess, Dogen study. But also, I really like to entice you, all of you, to, well, go to Sanshin website right after this and register <laughs> for Genzo. <laughs> You know, um, I always feel this way. Um, I'm a big fan of opera. And then, uh, you know, I always feel, God, I'm so unlucky. I was born so late. I didn't experience Maria Callas on the stage. But I was so lucky to be born uh, to catch her last leg of concert because uh, when I was a young boy, my parents took me to uh, Maria Callas' last concert with Giuseppe Di, Di Spano, Di, Di, uh, Di, Giuseppe Di Spano, no? gosh, I'm still losing Italian. But anyway, uh, so I called Maria Callas. So, yes, Okumano is retiring, and there's only uh, three more in San Shinji and one more in Chapel Hill Science Center. But at least you are able to catch the last leg of it so go to the <laughs> website right away and register and experience this. Uh, otherwise, years later, you will regret, God, I didn't go to that Maria Callas concert. I met so many people after that. So you will be like, God, his son told me that I didn't do that. And you will regret, so you must do that. Um, but anyway. <laughs> Next week, I really like to go into what I discovered through Kannongyo commentary and also my complete shift from uh, 
this side to the other side to how to see uh, Dharma. And this is also very important uh, common ground creating so that we can really continue to have a conversation. Uh, so uh, then I go into uh, in detail of uh, Kannon Gyo, uh, particularly the portion uh, I brought this and uh, I think Hoko-san is smiling and it, I'm sure it gets you back into the, uh, your old days in Japan, right? Uh, this is the uh, uh, standardized uh, Japanese priest's uh, chant book. And when you enter a uh, temple in Soto school temple uh, as a priest, this is the first thing given to you. And then uh, you have to memorize all of this. And uh, on, t uh, on this, uh, there's all those marks about how doshi moves, how do one hits, et cetera, et cetera. And then every morning, uh, practically every morning, except for the day of four and night, we start from Hanongyo. Seson, myosoku ga konju, monpi, bushi ga innen. So that portion I really like to talk about next week, and particularly in it, there's these 12 challenges, Juninan, and that became almost like my mantra after, uh, you know, uh, given this opportunity from Okumura Roshi. And that really started to uh, make me kind of clarify Dogen's teaching and then contemplate, so how does this mean to me now here? So uh, that's next week. It's time. Uh, yes. Do you want to take questions? Oh, uh, sure. Is that okay, time-wise? Yes. You know, I always tend to talk too much and push time on. Okay. So, um, well, I really didn't talk about the contents of Kannon Gyo today, but I think I really, uh, my purpose today was to kind of create the sense of excitement and joy for Dogen study and other Buddhist uh, text study, which is, which is very important for me. Uh, otherwise, it can kind of like dull, heady work. So if you have any, uh, you know, things to share, uh, I really would appreciate. Uh, speak up. Hi, this is Carla in Ann Arbor. Um, hi, Isan. It's oh, yes, Carla. Hi. Uh, oh, you remember me? It's so nice to see you. I wanted to. I, can't I just really see you, but <laughs> no, no. I'm, I know I'm in a little square right on the screen, but I just wanted to say hello and and oh. thank you for oh, coming. You. It's so wonderful to see you and um, for this wonderful talk and 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 in particular, thank you for starting off the series with um, a joyful mind. You know, I, I really, really appreciate that because that was also my first introduction to Dogen was this reading of actually Fukun Zazengi. And I, of course, didn't understand one thing, but yet something was there that was so beautiful that just kept me coming back to it over and over again. And so I, I really appreciated your story. So I'm really looking, I just wanted to say hi and welcome and thank you. And I'm looking forward to um, seeing you online during this ango. Oh, thank you very much. You know, um, uh, I was away for two years and thinking about the Sanshinji and the people in Sanshinji every single day. And it was really nice to, uh, you know, coming back and like immediately I arrive at the uh, dormitory. It was almost like a clear visceral sense. I finally came back home. So I really um, thank you for such a warm welcome. Uh, welcome, And I see uh, many of you did a lot to the temple. Beautiful wall. Uh, yes, Hoshin did this wall. Uh, despite of those uh, challenging two years, actually, um, even the temple itself physically looks better. <laughs> and I, um, one of my agenda during summer ango is I want to do something about the most garden too. <laughs> so if you could help me to do something about the most garden, that would be really appreciated. And thank you. Hey Arnold, just go come up with mute. If you have your hand up, just come up with mute and talk. Okay, sure. 
Isan, I, I just wanted to thank you for well, the activity itself, but also uh, sharing your compassionate activity during the AIDS epidemic. It's very profound. And um, obviously, I think it's uh, very important to ground our practice in something very human um, and the compassion side. Um, so it was very moving to hear that. Um, so just, just thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, we are all instructed by Dogen that uh, when we talk about something very difficult, uh, not really talking about directly to this, to that. Instead, we kind of look for some sort of analogy or symbolic way to talk about so that it will resonate the person, uh, so that the person itself can bring it into current situation. So. You probably already know this, but the reason why I incorporate all of those episodes I went through during AIDS epidemic is, of course, so that we can utilize it as a food of thought by reflecting on what's happening right now. Because what's happening right now, if we talk about it directly, we get a little too emotional, maybe, and then too one-sided. So it's probably a good idea to have a little bit of a distance and then have a little pause to reflect on it. So uh, that's actually one of my um, intentions, so to speak, through these uh, 10 time talks and also um, workshop. So I'm really glad um, you mentioned it. Thank you. Isan, this is Fusatsu from Atlanta. Thank you so much again for your talk and we're excited to have you here. Um, in Ango. Um, and again, I echo um, what Arnold said about the work with the, the AIDS population as well as uh, you must, I, I look forward to hearing you talk about the impermanence in that, you know, seeing so many of your friends and um, coworkers transition through that as we have with uh, COVID and also with the war. So I look forward to, to working with the things that arise um, through your experiences working with that with the, with that population as well as moving that into the our ex, our current practice. So uh, again, thank you so much for your your work um, with that population near and dear to my heart as well. And uh, again, um, look forward to hearing uh, more about the practice and also the the various readings um, that you have bringing forth in your shuso. Thank you.